Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. I'm Pastor Sue Collar. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Wherever you happen to be, whether you're driving along in your car, whether you're having a lazy morning in bed, whether you're sitting on your couch, eating a meal, sneaking away from work, wherever you happen to be, God unites us, space is no barrier, time is no barrier, and so we have gathered here today to worship. If you do happen to be watching this mor uh, Sunday morning at 10 o'clock on our Facebook uh, premiere for this, say hi in the comments. It's nice to see who's gathered, at least in that little, little time slot for our worship. It's one of the ways we help build community. And if you are new to us or just checking us out, head over to our website, fpclincoln.org and click the I'm new tab and sign up for coffee with the pastor. This is one way that even with our distance we try to connect. It gives you a chance to personally know a little bit more about us and gives us a chance to get to know you a little bit and what you're looking for and what your needs are. So again fpclincoln.org click I'm new and coffee with the pastor. If you would like a bulletin for today's service, you can still head over to our website, click the online or uh, click the listen and watch tab, and then online worship, and you will find the links to download both the bulletin for today's service and the announcement sheet about the things going on in the life of the church. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, and let us worship. People everywhere, clap your hands, shout to God with a joyful voice. For Yahweh, Most High, is awe-inspiring, the great ruler over the whole earth. God subdues peoples for us and puts the nations under our feet. God chooses our inheritance for us, the pride of Leah, Rachel, and Jacob, the object of God's love. God ascended the throne with a shout, with trumpet blasts. Sing praise to God, sing praise. Sing praise to our ruler, sing praise. For God rules over all the earth. Sing praise and understand. God rules over the nations. God sits on the throne of holiness. World leaders are gathered, and so are the people of Sarah and Abraham's God. For Yahweh reigns over all the earth and is exalted above all. That was Psalm 47. I'm Brad Henricks, and I'd like to welcome you to our online worship. I hope wherever you're worshiping, you have a great day. So today we will be reading Luke's version of Jesus' ascension, his return to God. As he goes, he tells his disciples to wait. The Holy Spirit will come and fill them with power from on high. So they wait with joyful, hopeful expectation. Were their hopes fulfilled? It's a question that we all need to wrestle with, especially in light of the events of this past week. How do we reconcile God's promises with 
the reality of war and death that we see so much of in today's world? How do we reconcile God's words that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we will have power in this world to bring God's message and, and actual life into this world when we are grieving the deaths of 19 children and their teachers and from Texas? As we come to God and worship, these are the kinds of questions that we bring, and we're looking for answers. I don't know what all the answers are that each one of us will receive, but I pray that whatever those answers are, they give us both a sense of comfort and a sense of direction. Uh, my name is Lynn Hughes. First Presbyterian Church has been part of my life for over 60 years. I've been able to do lots of different types of service. And right now I'm serving as an usher, which really is probably one of my favorite things to do because I get to welcome uh, visitors and I get to uh, say good morning to my old friends. Let's listen for the word of God for us today from Luke 24, 44 to 53. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from is Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. A word of God that is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Audacious Hope. I picked this sermon title long before the events of this past week when an 18-year-old entered Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, and wearing body armor and armed with two AR platform rifles, killed 19 children and two teachers. How does one have hope in this world when we are continually faced with these kinds of horrific events? I'm preaching today from one of our, our Sunday school classrooms. We have precious children in these classrooms every Sunday. We also have school teachers, some retired, some still working, teaching them. I can guarantee you, at least I think I can guarantee you, that when these teachers did their teacher training, they didn't have to learn how to deal with an active shooter in the school or how to use their own bodies to protect their children. I grew up having earthquake drills in school. Our children are growing up having active shooter drills. At our prayer service Wednesday evening, we read a litany of mass shootings that went back to 2012. It took almost 13 minutes to read them all. And that was only those that fit the definition of a mass shooting. Four or more dead, not including the shooter. We would still be at it if we lowered that number from four down to three or to two or, or even to one. Like in the recent shooting in the Taiwanese Presbyterian Church in Laguna Woods where a gunman entered the church, locked the doors, and armed with guns and Molotov cocktails, managed to kill only one person before the congregation tackled and hogtied him. I'm angry. And many of you have expressed the same thing. 
angry at the situation, angry at those in power who have the power to do something about it and choose not to, angry at those who argue against doing anything to protect our children in school. Our kids should be able to go to school and not be afraid of dying. Parents should be able to drop their kids off at the doors of the school on Monday morning and not be afraid that they won't be able to pick up their child at the end of the day. We're also angry at ourselves because we don't know what we could possibly do to make a difference and we feel powerless. So what do we do with that anger? And is there guidance from our faith? Today's scripture is Jesus' commission to his disciples. This is his charge to them after he spent time teaching them after the resurrection. He tells them the work they are, they are to carry on after he leaves. They are to proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sins to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. Then he tells them to wait for the Holy Spirit who will fill them with the power to do this. Now when Jesus died, Jerusalem was still a bustling city. It was full of life. But when the Gospel of Luke was written, there was hardly one stone left standing on another. The temple had been destroyed. All of this due to both internal fights within the Jewish family and rebellion against Rome. It was all about power and control and it left Jerusalem a smoldering ruin. Surrounded by dust and ashes, Luke dares to claim an audacious hope that the God who raised Jesus to life can bring life out of the most hopeless of circumstances. Now Luke doesn't tell us what his readers thought standing in the midst of a smoldering city. He just tells us that the first disciples, after hearing that, went to the temple and praised God continually. They believed they had this hope of this world to come. But for Luke's readers, I have to believe there was a disconnect between what they were hearing and what they were seeing. Jesus was telling them a new day was dawning, but they were still standing in a city in ruins. There was growing conflict between the church and the synagogue, and Christians were fast becoming the scapegoat of the Roman Empire. And yet even then, Luke has the audacious hope that dares to believe that there was indeed a new day coming. But it wasn't going to come about by some magical act of God, but through changed hearts, changed minds, and changed action. In the ruins of Jerusalem, people could see what comes of people's hunger for power and control. It was not life. It was not joy. It was not justice. It was death. It was ruin. Luke's readers heard Jesus charge to them to preach the gospel, the good news of repentance and forgiveness of sins, as if that could make a difference. Understand what Jesus was asking of them. Repentance is not about saying, I'm sorry for what I've done. It's not confession. It's not about getting people to own up to their failures or how bad they are, how much they missed the mark. It's not about blame. To repent means to make a 180 degree turn. It's an action word. So it's not about an abuser saying, I'm sorry I won't hit you again. It's saying, I'm sorry I won't hit you again. And I'm going to take an anger, anger management course or work with a counselor to help me deal with my anger so I won't do it again. And then they actually follow up and do that. Repentance is not just about words or feelings. There's action involved. That's why thoughts and prayers are so cliche. It's easy to say, but it doesn't require anything of us. It doesn't require us to change or do anything. 
fact, it, it kind of pushes the responsibility for healing the word on uh, the world on God, as if we don't have a role in that. And I think we all know that's not true. Repentance is about accountability. First, our own. Are we walking in Christ's footsteps? Are we loving our neighbor? Are we forgiving each other? Are we welcoming the stranger and feeding the hungry and visiting the prisoners? Are we standing up for those unjustly accused? We can't expect anyone else to embrace a different way of being in the world if we don't. Repentance is also about holding others accountable, especially those with legislative power to change things for the better. I know that this is a dangerous moment. You're all wondering, is she going to get political? And actually, yes, I am, because the prophets did. This is exactly what the prophets did in the Old Testament. A whole nation may have chased after other gods, but the prophets held the kings accountable. Not only did they have the power, they had the responsibility to care. So the prophets spoke out against injustice, and they demanded that those in power use their power to lift up the poor, to care for the needy, to establish God's distributive justice, to make sure everyone has everything they need to thrive, and no one was crushed under the weight of society's injustice. That's what they asked. So to preach repentance is political in the sense that we're holding people accountable. And it is also to recognize that people have responsibility for their own choices. It's to point out when somebody is headed down the wrong road, an, an unhealthy path, uh, path for themselves and society, and encourage them to turn around, to come back to the ways that reflect God's values, to be in the world differently. That's why repentance is different from forgiveness. Notice Jesus charged his disciples with preaching repentance and forgiveness, not one or the other. Forgiveness means I'm not going to define you by your sin. Forgiveness is saying it's possible to make a change. It's possible to do better. It's possible to be different. And I'm going to give you the space to do that. I'm going to give you the support to do that. God doesn't define us by our failings. And God allows us to change without shaming us. Forgiveness is necessary if our society, if our country, is ever going to get beyond the divisions of hatred that seem to be growing daily. But forgiveness has to be accompanied by repentance for real change to happen. That willingness to learn from our mistakes that willingness to recognize when we have strayed from the ways of love and to make a better choice. If we're ever going to move closer to the promised world of a better world, if we're ever going to see life emerge from what feels hopeless, then we need both forgiveness and repentance on all of our parts. Standing in the ruins of Jerusalem, I wonder if those early Christians felt lost like we do, wondering what in the world can they do in the face of such hatred and violence and abuse of power? Luke reminds us that we are not without power. We are not without resources. Change will happen, but not just by our own power, but through the power of God within us. When we are about God's work, God works with us. We're not alone. We have power. We have the power to persist in the face of opposition. We have the power that comes from knowing that the God who stands with us is the same one who brings life out of death. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit who works in unseen ways to soften hearts and bring about repentance. We're not alone in this. This is the same power that gave courage to the early martyrs of the church who stood up for their faith. 
This is the same power that fed Martin Luther King Jr. and the other civil rights leaders. I know there are many of us who are wondering if this world and its wars and mass shootings and divisions and hatred could ever get better. We must remember that we worship the God who defeated death, actually who brought life out of death. We worship the God who is with us. We worship the God who gives us power to persist. We worship the God who calls us to preach the good news of repentance and forgiveness of sins. And those aren't just words. They are real, concrete expressions of the audacious hope that God's promises of a world at peace, a world where guns are beaten into plowshares, a world where Democrats and Republicans work together for the common good, will actually come true. Will it be easy? No. Will it be quick? No. Will it be worth it? Yes. Because we're inviting people to be a part of a better world. Because in preaching repentance and forgiveness and practicing it ourselves, we give people a glimpse of what is possible. Because every time a heart is changed or a mind is changed, we're a little bit closer to the world as God intended. Because every time we look at a child, we know we're making this world a safer and a better place for them. Let us go out and live and preach repentance and forgiveness to all the world. It will matter. So in my sermon, I asked the question, what do we do with this anger? 
And what does our faith have to say about it? How does it guide us? How do we as a people of faith make our voices heard for the values of God? How do we stand up for those who nobody else is listening to, the children? It took over an hour for the SWAT team to enter that school and save those kids. One hour. No one was listening to them, even when they were calling 911. So what can we do as a people of faith? And what we decided is probably the most effective thing we could do at the moment is have a letter writing campaign. Not just sending letters to our own Congress people, but to send letters to all of our senators in Congress and all of our legislators here in Nebraska, and include in those letters the litany of mass shootings since 2012. Will it make a difference? We won't know till we try. But if we could get hundreds and hundreds of people sending this to the senators and to the legislature, I have to believe someone's gonna notice. And if they notice, maybe a heart will be changed or at least a seed will be planted. We're gonna have several versions of a letter available, so you could pick a template that works, uh, that says what you want it to say. I know that we have different views about what the solution is to the gun violence in our nation. So we're gonna have some options there, but watch for this opportunity. When we get it set up, we'll let you know because we're tired of just saying thoughts and prayers. You may have noticed on our communion table back here, we have candles, 21 candles, for the 19 children and two teachers shot this past week. At our worship service on Wednesday night, we held a prayer service to remember, to express our, low, our anguish and our grief and our anger about the shooting in Uvalde, Texas. And we lit these candles then a reminder that they are with us, always. For our prayers of intercession today, I want to offer part of the prayer that I wrote on our church Facebook page right after the shooting. Because we cannot pray today without keeping the needs of that community in our prayers, without remembering the anguish of the parents and the family and the friends and the neighbors and everybody in that community whose lives have been devastated and torn apart and turned upside down. We worship a God who weeps with us. May God offer us comfort. Let us pray. God, you have called us, your followers, to be there for the children, to stand up for them, to protect them, and to provide for them. We have failed over and over again. Each time we make excuses, and then we give our power to those who have not proved themselves responsible with that kind of power, expecting them to do something. Forgive us. Give us courage to fight for what is right and to put the needs of children above our own desires. Remind us that you have given us power for life. You are with us. And so we dare to have that audacious hope that with you all things truly are possible. Our hearts go out to the parents of the children and teachers killed at Robb Elementary School. We can't even imagine what they are going through. Be with them. And be with them through the hands and the hearts of those gathered around. It is too soon to ask for healing from grief. Sometimes it just needs to be experienced in its fullness to honor the love. Hold those who grieve tight and walk with them. For those injured, we ask for healing and strength, for much will be needed. We pray that wisdom and courage will finally break into the hearts and minds of our elected leaders and indeed all people for the responsibility is all of ours. To say that nothing can be done is to
fail the great responsibility we have been given. Give our leaders wisdom and guide us all in having sane conversations about violence that we might become a country that truly does honor all life at all times. Lord, there are so many other concerns on our hearts. They are no less important. Be with us as we navigate those. Be a support and healer to those in need and a source of joy as well, reminding us that there's still good in this world. We just sometimes lose sight of it in the face of immense tragedies and worries. While we weep with those who weep, may we also not be afraid to laugh with those who have found joy. By your Holy Spirit, hold the church in unity and keep us faithful to your word so that we may be one with Christ in faith and love and service. We pray these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The work of the church is not just to pray, but it's to act. It is to be that agent of justice in the world. But the work of the church is also to laugh and to celebrate and to play. It is all needed, especially in days where life is hard. We've got some things coming up in the life of the church that I hope you'll take note of. If you have always wondered what the book of Revelation was really about, we've got a class for you. Starting June 6th on Zoom, we're going to study the book of Revelation. If you like music, on June 10th we have the Harana concert, Arts for the Soul concert with Harana. And it's a free concert, it's an outdoor concert. What a wonderful time to come together and enjoy some music and some fellowship. If you value people of all stripes, no matter what their diversity represents, no matter who they are, Pride Fest is coming up, and our church is going to have a booth at Pride Fest this year. That's June 17th and 18th. It's one way that we let those who have been hurt by the church know that this is a safe place for them. All of these, you can find out more on our website. Just go to fpclincoln.org and click the Events tab. You'll find out everything you need to know about these three events and many other activities going on in our church in the weeks to come. You could also download the announcement sheet again at our website. Just click on the watch and listen tab and you'll find the download link there and it will have more information as well. Remember, church is all of us coming together however we can to celebrate and to work. Good morning. As we move into the summer season here in the Midwest, we all look for reasons to be outside and enjoy the wonderful warm weather. Thanks to your generous giving, our outdoor space here at First Presbyterian is refreshed and welcoming. One of our mission goals is to stay in this neighborhood and improve the area for its families and residents. Having an outdoor space that reflects the beauty of our building and our congregation is important. When you have some time, visit the courtyard and enjoy the plantings and peaceful surroundings. Check out some of the new bushes that were planted in the church's landscaping and think about the people and donations who made these possible. Please pray with me. Dear God, thank you for light and warmth. Thank you for the sun. Thank you for the gifts of nature for the annual cycles and seasons. Today, give that grace again to see you as the creator, the one who lifts us up to be with you forever, even now. Amen. It's your choice how you choose to give, text, online, in person. There'll be information at the bottom of the screen. Everything is welcome. Thank you. We go out into a world that is hurting. 
We go out into a world that doesn't believe God's power is real. We're going out into a world that at times has lost hope. As children of God, as followers of Jesus Christ, as recipients of the power of the Holy Spirit, we are invited to go out into that world and to bring an audacious hope that lets people know that whatever is happening right now is not the end. It does not define our lives. It does not define our future. Our future is defined by God's love. And one day, that love will truly fill the world. So go out and share that good news. And for those who are having a hard time believing, be Christ to them. Be present with them. Don't try to convince them. Don't try to, to make them believe something that they aren't ready to, to believe, to let go of something they aren't ready to let go of. Be Christ to them. Friends, the world needs us. As you go out, know that you go out in the power of the Holy Spirit who fills you up and sends you forth and walks with you every step of the way. Amen. Thanks for joining us at First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. Find out more about us at fpclincoln.org or find us on Facebook.